Good morning. This is a movie. It's created by the Lawrence Hall of Science in Berkeley. And it is a time-lapse video of the weather patterns over the San Francisco Bay. And it's meant to acquaint young students with fluctuations in weather patterns. It's very effective. I certainly enjoy watching it. Of course, students who are blind or visually disabled will need this presented by other means. So, not all data is this dramatic. Weather patterns are large scale, they undergo great changes. Other types of information are less theatrical. Say, for example, you needed to know about the tide levels in the San Francisco Bay. A time-lapse video would not be nearly as compelling because the changes in water level are only on the order of feet over days. So you would probably get more technical and look at a visual graph like this one. And you can see the fluctuations in water levels over time. And if you were not able to see this because of an impairment, how might I impart this to you? Well, I, I could try singing it, where if I uh, considered that to be a pitch contour and I went, and, and so on. Or I could do better than that. I could use a software synthesis program, Super Collider, and I could create a water-like sound and create a series of very short overlapping sound events, the pitch of which follow this contour, and it would sound something like this. Now, the time scale here is completely arbitrary. This is two days of tidal activity. I can make it play back over as much or as little listening time as I choose. Now, when you download information about the tides, you get other information as well. You get information about the water temperature. Here's a pulsing sound. The speed of the pulsing and the brightness of the sound reflect the temperature levels, so that faster pulsing and a brighter timbre reflects higher temperatures. You get information about the wind. Here's a series of overlapping noise bursts. The pitch of them are reflecting the speed. The attack time, the sharpness or the dullness of each of these bursts represents the gust factor, and the stereo panning reflects the direction. And you get information about the air, too. Here's an airy, pitchy sound. The pitch of it reflects the temperature level and the proportion of whistliness versus noisiness reflects the barometric pressure. So, you put all of these together and you get something like this. This is a process called sonification, where data sets are represented as sound. It's just like visualization, really, where information is represented by visual symbols. With sonification, we represent information with auditory symbols. And the idea of studying science with sound is not new to me, and it seems to be gaining some currency. I heard an NPR story recently about astrophysical sonification software that was designed for a blind researcher to study the data sets. But the really interesting point that they made was that her sighted colleagues often found themselves relying on this as well because there were patterns in the data that they were better able to perceive with their ears than with their eyes using standard visualization software. And this raises a very interesting and important point. This is not only about accessibility, valid though that is in and of itself, but it's also about the nature of perception and how the different senses in some ways complement each other and in other ways supplement each other. We tend to be visually oriented and to underappreciate the contributions that the other senses give us. But we know that blind people can hear, rather, they can use their ears as their eyes and see their way around with their ears. Moreover, people who have their sight taken from them temporarily find that they can learn to do this quite readily. They can learn to see with their ears. 
And the way this happens uh, has to do with a lot of complicated factors, but it goes back to that observation from the sonification software. The ears are really good at detecting patterns and dynamic changes. And this, of course, is how we appreciate music. Patterns of vibrations give us pitches and timbres, and patterns of pitches and timbres and rhythms give us music. To get an idea of the role that our ears play in perception, you can try this simple test at home. Next time you're watching a movie on your DVD player, just mute the audio. Keep the subtitles on, you'll be able to follow the plot. But I guarantee you, no matter how spectacular the visuals are and how big your screen is, it will not be as engaging an experience without the soundtrack. Sound and music have a particular embrace, a particular intimacy to them. And when that is taken away, the experience is flattened considerably. So thanks to support from Penn State's Colleges of Arts and Architecture and IST and their NC2IF Center, I've been able to contribute some sonifications to a project being developed by some people at Lawrence Labs in Berkeley. It's a project called Rhythms of the Universe, and it is the brainchild of two very wise people who are from complementary backgrounds. George Smoot is best known for winning the 2006 Nobel Prize in Physics, and a good deal of his Nobel funding has gone towards the creation of an integrated research, education, and outreach initiative that is designed to inspire people to study science and to set the agenda for science and science education in the 21st century. His partner in this project is Mickey Hart, who is probably best known for being one of the drummers for the Grateful Dead, but he is also a writer and ethnomusicologist. We have him largely to thank for the world music movement. And he is a person who is passionately interested in the role of music as a cultural and a healing force. And lately he has taken with including sonifications in his music as a way of representing universals in it. So Rhythms of the Universe will be a multimedia presentation that explores humankind's yearning to understand the cosmos and where this yearning may take us as a species. It will include narration from these two, it will have images, it will have video, it will have music, and it will have sonifications. And it's an interesting project to work on because it has two bottom lines. I mean, the bottom line is that it has to be attractive to viewers, it has to look good, it has to sound good, people have to want to watch this. But the real bottom line is that the sonifications have to be intrinsically related to the data sets. This can't just be new space music. They have to have integrity, and by listening to them, one needs to be able to hear the contours of the data. So the project is still being developed, but I thought I would share some of the sonifications that I've created for it here today. We might start at the center of our solar system with our sun. Helioseismologists look at a graph like this. It illustrates the vibrational nodes of the sun, sunquakes. So if we were to start with this, We could follow solar winds out through our solar system. And beyond into the larger galaxy.
to phenomena that we can't see but that we know exist, rhythms of space-time that underlie the pulsations of our existence. And the farther out we look, the farther back in time we look, until we find ourselves looking at what remains of the very beginning, the echoes of the Big Bang. Okay, so what was that? Is that music? Well, we like the way it sounds, but rather than get into academic discussions of semantics and definitions, I'm happy enough to fall back on John Cage and simply say that if you don't think that what I do is music, then by all means, feel free to call it something else. Is it sonification, really? Has this informed us of anything? You know, I can't say yes or no for sure. We haven't tried to glean information from this. Certainly it is a different kind of creation than the sonification software that I mentioned earlier. Some would say that this is better called data music, in which case I would fall back on Cage again and say, if that's what you would like to call it, I have no problem with that. Is this science? Well, a number of these sonifications were played at George Smoot's summer workshop last year. The people there enjoyed them. This project has great interest from a number of leading science museums. But are the arts and the sciences really that separate? To many of civilization's great innovators, they were not. To Pythagoras, to Galileo, it was their mastery of both that informed them to make many of their discoveries. The distinction is a recent imposition on our part. The universe, like music, consists of vibrations. If listened to in the right way, shouldn't they sound beautiful? Can the sounds of science satisfy the human thirst for music? Can the sounds of science teach us about science? Ultimately, of course, my goal would be to drive the golden spike and to create sonifications that are not only musically compelling, but also scientifically informative. If I don't do it, I'm sure that somebody else will. If that somebody else turns out to be one of these students, that would be just fine with me too. I won't presume to speak on behalf of Mickey Hart or George Smoot or anyone involved with Rhythms of the Universe, but I sense that we all share a similar sentiment, which is that if we can ignite the spark that leads a student to drive that golden spike or any other golden spike, then that would be as valuable a legacy as anything else that we might do during our time here. Thank you very much.